computer says it's 631. Uh, good evening. Welcome. I need my Bible. How are you? So first of all, happy Advent to you all. Uh, the four-week period of preparation for the nativity. Uh, in a very true sense, we opened up the season of Advent this past Sunday, and we have four weeks of Advent, and uh, we wear violet for three of them. We wear the color rose or pink on the third Sunday of Advent is kind of a halfway point, and uh, we're in the midst of it. So. I actually, if you notice, there were, there's a plethora of food over at the snack table, but someone made me an advent wreath out of cookies. That's awesome. Uh, so you can have an advent wreath cookie uh, as we get ready for uh, this evening. Uh, so we're going to read this upcoming Sunday's gospel passage. By the way, of course, I wasn't here the past two weeks. I appreciate uh, our presenters. Hopefully you found that beneficial. And as you walked in, there is a book, Your Guide to the Mass. Uh, pick that up. It'll help you out and help you understand and give you further knowledge of the class that was given last week on the Mass. The weekend before that, I believe, was on confirmation and baptism, I believe. So we are in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. The season of baptism, I mean, sorry, the season of Advent is not really just a period of preparing for Jesus' birthday. So Advent means coming. And so the season of Advent focuses on two comings. The, the first coming of Jesus when he was a little baby. But also the second coming, we believe that Jesus is going to come again. And so... The season of, of Advent also focuses on Jesus coming at the end of the world. So one of the great figures, the people that we focus on during Advent is on John the Baptist, who he was the one who announced the coming of Jesus at the end of time, uh, announced Jesus' Jesus' coming, he was his cousin. So we're in Matthew chapter 3, this is page 13 in the New Testament. This will be the Gospel passage this Sunday. In those days, John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was of him the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to, him, said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruits as evidence of your repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance. But the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, his winnowing fan in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barns. The chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So this gospel passage uh, in the midst of baptism is supposed to remind us of the first coming of Christ when he began his public ministry. And remind us of our call to repentance. John the Baptist called people to repentance. Because that's what he's saying here at the River Jordan. He was sent by God 
to call people to turn away from their sin and to turn towards God. And that's ultimately our the, the great call of the church. That's what this season of Advent is about, is us to turn away from sin, to turn back to God, and uh, to be prepared all the more for the coming of our Lord uh, when He comes again. I think it's interesting, I want to just focus on this a little bit. So, so this, is the, this is the opening of Matthew's Gospel. So imagine that you are a Jew uh, at the time of Jesus' birth, early Christianity, and you are reading Matthew's Gospel. And right in the very, very beginning, John the Baptist shows up on the bank of the River Jordan. Everyone's coming out to meet John the Baptist. And then your religious leaders show up, your Pharisees and your Sadducees show up, and John the Baptist is greeting words to the hierarchy, to the religious leaders of the time is, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. You see this, really, I mean, those are fight words, major fight words. John the Baptist is, 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 this is like a debate between Trump and Hillary. This isn't nice. This isn't politically correct. This is ugly. And then he, he, he says, produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. He's saying, don't think that just because you're a scribe of the Pharisees that you're righteous and you're going to heaven. He says, even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. He's saying to, to the scribes and the Pharisees, like, show me how your religious acts and your religious piety is bearing fruit in the world. If it's not, get out of town. Repent. Change your life. A huge part of what the Lord invites us to is, is, is to really to be missionaries, to, to go forth and to, to bear fruit, to, to, to change people's lives, to change the world for the good. Um, Pope Francis He's very key on talking about what is a missionary disciple. That every Christian is called to be a missionary disciple. Every Christian is called to have a mission. And to be on mission. I'm reading this book right now. Uh, all of you will get a, a free copy. It will be your Christmas present. Um, it's a new book by Matthew Kelly called Resisting Happiness. But in it, he, the third to last chapter, is that every single Christian needs to be a missionary. And he goes forth and he gives two examples, two kind of radical examples of, of, of Christians that do this. Uh, one was a 74-year-old lady who had kind of fallen away from living her faith and practicing her faith. And she read a good Christian book, converted back to the faith and uh, saying prayers and being faithful. And then she was like, well, I'm 74 years old. I'm shut into my home. I can't drive. Like, well, how do I, how do I become a missionary disciple? So she... Bought a box of books, and every day she would wake up and she would pray a rosary. When she was praying the rosary, she would think of someone in her life that she thought could use a book to enlighten their mind and their heart and help their day out. So she committed that day that every day she was going to write a letter and mail a book to someone. And she's now done this for like five or six years, every single day. She sent books to presidents, to other countries, to other nations, to, to, to politicians, to, and the letters she gets back from people is unbelievable. She started off with her aunts, with, 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 with her nieces and nephews and her neighbors and her, you know, the mailman and all, but, and she ended it, but it's, anyways, it's one of these stories, like, this woman realized that she was called to be a missionary, and she's like, okay, I'm going to figure out a way to do this. The other story that he, he, he tells is there, there, there's a guy who Matthew Kelly became friends with, and this, this gentleman really, really struggled because he was, he owned like two or three businesses and was really, really good at making money. 
But in his heart, he felt that he was supposed to be doing something for God. And so he constantly felt conflicted. Like, how do I, I'm really successful at business, but I feel like I'm supposed to be doing something for God. And for like years, he would like agonize over this. And Matthew Kelly kind of kept being friends with them and kind of giving him advice and checking up on him. And eventually the man realized, my gift is to make money. The question is what I do with it. So for a while that he was actually discerning, he was thinking about leaving business and dedicating his life as a missionary. But then he realized that the way that he was called to be a missionary was to make a lot of money, but to be a financial supporter of those who are in the missions. So he runs his businesses, he makes great money, he does volunteer at his parish as a catechist for, he teaches confirmation class for high school kids, but he, he makes good money and uses his good money to, to help the missions. And so it's just one of those great things like John the Baptist is challenging the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time, like, show us your fruit. Like, how are you bearing fruit in the world? And if you're not, like, there's an ax at, at the base of your tree. And, and then you, 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 John the Baptist continues, um, his winnowing fan is in his hand. He'll clear with uh, the, the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. The chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And it's this whole terrible image of heaven and hell. Uh, but this invitation for us to say, okay, how do we bring light into the world? How do we bring uh, joy into the world? And uh, Advent is, well, every day of the year is a great time to do that. But Advent is a great time for us to always kind of do a self-check and say, okay, where am I at? What's going on? How am I uh, serving others and making a difference in the world? So... Amen. Yes. Could you do a brief explanation of the difference between the baptism of repentance that John the Baptist did and the Easter Vigil baptism that you do? Well, so baptism of repentance would be the baptism part isn't, isn't even necessary. Anyone at any point in their life can have a conversion and not be baptized. Anyone can be can say, I'm turning away from my sin and I want to draw closer to God. Anyone can do that. And thanks be to God that they do. I would say that anybody of you who are seeking baptism, God willing, you've already, that, that, that's what you've already done. Sacramental baptism that, that it would be impossible for John the Baptist to give a true sacramental baptism, one because Christ hadn't died and risen from the grave yet, so baptism in Christ incorporates us fully into Christ sacramentally. So it, it enters us intimately into the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord. It washes away our sins and the two symbols of baptism, washing away of sin and making us a member of God's family. Uh, so true sacramental baptism enters us perfectly and completely into the life and the mission of the church. So th those would be kind of the, the, the two distinctions. Hopefully there is a sense, there, well, there, had, there needs to be a sense of repentance prior to one entering into that relationship with God in a sacramental way. So, great question. Did that answer your question? Maybe. Okay, um, so tonight we're going to watch one of my favorite movies ever. So if you watch Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Miracle on 34th Street and other Christmas movies, this should be on your Christmas movie list. You should watch it every single year. You can find it on YouTube. It's called The Star of Bethlehem. It will blow your mind. I'm dead serious. We do this every single year, and people are like, this is amazing. This is where science and faith, this is where science supports faith in an amazing way. So this is looking at astrology to actually give us, in a certain sense, proof and acknowledgement about the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing. So we're going to watch this. I'm going to be annoying and stop it every now and then, uh, like I do, to emphasize points that if you don't haven't watched it six or seven or eight or more times like I have, you it's easy to just kind of pass over. So um, ready? Here we go.
Um, I think it's phenomenal. The more I watch it, the more that I just look at it, I'm just like, this is, like, unbelievable. Uh, when he asked the question at the, at the very end, and I'm, tremendous respect. When he asked the question <laughs> after he discovers the, the blood moon and uh, Virgo at our Lord's death, um, I find it interesting. He asked the question, God, what have you done? I would say, God, what have you not done? When you realize the completeness of what God has done, you can ask the question, God, what have you not thought of? Like, you, know, you go to like the, the perfect wedding or the perfect party, and you're like, gosh, what did this hostess not think of? Like, they did everything right. And like, that's our God. Like, he is, and I think you know, this reflection that he puts at the end of it, they're like, when God created the world, I mean, if, if the stars and the planets are, are a perfect science uh, and mathematical equation, like, that's unbelievable when you begin to comprehend that. But we can say this about all things of science. That's why the human body is amazing. I mean, like, the human body is a testament alone that there is God and that God exists. I mean, it really is mind-boggling the way that the human body works. Like that baby right there is like unbelievable. The fact that women can have babies is, um, it's like that's within itself is a miracle. I mean like, my stomach does nothing. Uh, except make belly button light. But nonetheless, um, that's black by the way. Um, so it just shows, and this is, you know, you've heard me say this before in other, like, we have nothing to fear when it comes to science because science simply exposes to us the glory of God, which is what it, which is what science is intended to be. I've actually preached a homily on this presentation on the Epiphany, which is the celebration of the three wise men coming. And part of my homily is the fact of like science is awesome, and the astrologers were scientists who came and worshipped Jesus. Like that perfect order. Like scientists are using their intellect and their their knowledge to understand the glory of God and his creation in, in a deeper sense. It's really, really beautiful and profound stuff. So I think it's a great Christmas film. I uh, share it with your friends. It's all and his his website is really, really good. It's phenomenal stuff on there. And this is kind of all over the place on the internet. You can find it everywhere. Uh, it's a great video to share. You can say, hey, we watched this last night. You might consider this. It might be interesting for you to think about. Um, next week, on December the 8th, it's a, uh, next Thursday, for us as Catholics, is a holy day of obligation. The following week, we'll be back for classes. Our class is on the Blessed Virgin Mary because next week we celebrate one of Mary's feast days. Um, so it'll, the, the whole class following that will be explaining what we believe about Mary, why we believe about Mary. But I didn't think like this is like, okay, I'm just gonna say like, this gentleman is not a, a Roman Catholic, but like, look at the stars. Like even the stars point out to the fact that Mary has a role in all of this and that it's pretty important. Like women are awesome. <laughs> so um, we, so anyways, next, anyways, mass next Thursday, there's, all opportunities to go to Mass for the Holy Divine Gushion, but one of them is 7 o'clock here on Thursday. So if you accidentally show up for class at 6.30, you'll see the lights on the church, and you'll be like, oh, I can just go to Mass. Um, and uh, so that's fantastic. Any questions? Let's say a prayer. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for everything that is good. We ask you to bless us during these Advent days. Help us prepare worthily for the coming of your Son both in our remembrance of his birth and also at his coming at the end of time. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, in the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.